<laughs> We're back. <laughs> it's, it's, uh, we went cash today. We did. I was going to say. We We're running out of up. shirts. <laughs> We're running out of energy. We're running out of shirts. Well, it's that time of year. Right. So just so you know, we've taped these in advance because it's coming up in the holidays and we're not, she and I aren't, aren't going to be able to get together as much. So we decided to tape a bunch in advance. So that's why you see the Christmas lights behind us, yes. which I'm like, should I take them down? She's like, no, no. it's us. This it's real. We are. So we're real sorry TV. if you get distracted by the Christmas lights in the back. <laughs> and I thought, I think that today's topic is really apropos. And hold on, because the train, I'm going to close this door so we don't hear the train. See, we um, live in the real world just <laughs> like you. Right. So, um, so what we were talking about, and I had talked about this because I feel like this time of year, I notice my drinking increases this time of year mm -hmm. because my stress level increases this time of year. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that we have talked about this before. I think we did a, did a segment on this um, on CBS 12. How do you know <laughs> when you have an addiction? Mm -hmm. um, because you know, it's not so clear cut mm -hmm. in a lot of cases. I think, you know, when you see the addict, you think, oh, they can't work. They are hiding liquor bottles in the cabinets and, you know, or they're, they're not able to function. Mm -hmm. But there's so many people who function with addiction. Yeah, and that's kind of what we would call late stage addiction. You know, first thing to know is alcoholism addiction is a disease and it's a progressive disease. So what that word progressive means is it's kind of a beginning, a middle, and an end stage. So we see different things in the beginning stage. Like for example, in the beginning stage of alcoholism, you just look like a college student. Right. You're fine. <laughs> You're doing the yeah. same thing that everybody else is doing, right? No big deal. Um, interestingly, I well, I don't want to out anybody. My daughter just went away to college. So, you know, I hear stories and whatever, and it's like at the end of the day, as a trained professional, I can start to look at some of that drinking in college that where that is not what we see. Right. That is a little bit on the outsider extreme. But for the most part, you know, people go to college, everybody's drinking, everybody's doing it, everybody's partying. Mm -hmm. But, um, and so it can look very comparable. And that's beginning stage. And so maybe after you talk to somebody who's sober, what they might say to you is in college, all my friends and I would go out drinking, but at two, they were ready to go home and I was mad and I wanted to go Keep to drinking. the after party club yeah. and continue till five or six. The party is never over for that mm -hmm. person. And they would say things like, you know, my friends would go out and have fun and whatever. I would go back to somebody's room and have sex and I didn't even know who they were. And then I would wake up and I would feel horrible about myself. So these are kind of some of the beginning signs of addiction is that we compromise our values. We do things that we're ashamed of, we're embarrassed of, we can't believe that we did after the fact when we wake up the next morning or whatever it's like we wake up with that kind of um i love the word like ugada feeling like oh you all, and oh. you all know that person you know hopefully you're not that yeah. person but we all knew that person no you know? it's so true and i mean i went to university of florida which was the biggest party school <laughs> yes. in the state so at that point right? <laughs> right and so we you know i was around a lot of drinkers or whatever mm -hmm. But I also knew a lot of people who had a really great time and then came home and the next morning they weren't embarrassed or ashamed. But I also knew people where they were like come out of the dorm like, you know, like, oh, or they were doing the walk of shame and, you know, they're calling and they don't even know where they are. Can you right. pick me up? I don't know where we're I am. are calling to make sure you're not mad at them. Yeah. <laughs> oh, remorseful. Right. You know, so yeah, right. so it, there is a little bit of a shift. You know, we see that signs of addiction is that we're often remorseful and ashamed after the fact and we compromise our value systems and we do things that we really do don't want to, to do, do that are kind of I love the expression when you go to AA meetings I love the things people say and I remember hearing a lot you know I did something against my own will mm. like my brain took me there I had to have another drink I had to have another drink and so I did this but I didn't even want to yeah right so that's kind of early stage middle stage addiction you start to see consequences we call them consequences like mm -hmm. uh, you're pregnant and you never wanted to be and you don't know who the daddy is yeah. right you have a DUI and you don't remember driving your spouse isn't speaking to you and you have no recollection of why, why they're not speaking to you your children run from you you know when you get home late because they're not sure if you're drunk and they think that's a scary daddy so you're starting to have consequences you're having consequences but it doesn't have to be that dramatic i mean can can a can okay can a couple of glasses of wine a night 
be an addiction? If you talk to someone in a treatment center and you go to them and you say, I'm just worried about my alcoholism, and I'm just worried about my alcohol okay. intake, um, and the, we are trained, most of us are going to look for consequences because that's the difference between a social drinker or you know a person who's self-medicating now here's what's so dicey about this Suzanne yeah. there's so many labels there's so many categories do I self-medicate with food yes. yes do I daydream about a filet mignon on a rough day yes, yes. I do is it causing Addiction. me, am I eating filet mignon every night? Am I am I 75 pounds overweight? Mm -hmm. Is my family saying, you got to stop. You, mm -hmm. you know, you're out of control. If they run out of steak, you scream at the waiter. Like, mm -hmm. are there consequences? Most of us self-medicate in different ways. Shopping, an extra glass of wine, sugar, chocolate, mm -hmm. right? Most of us self-medicate. But when you're talking about addiction, you're talking about consequences. Okay. And you talk about consequences in different areas of your life. Socially, your friends, you all know this person. Yeah, I, I'm not going out with you because yeah. last time you got so fall down drunk and you right. encouraged those guys to hit on us and I, you know, I'm not, I don't wanna be around you, right? right? Socially, you, your um, relationship and your marriage, so your relationship that your spouse is like, you know what, you go without me because right. you get so mean when you drink, I don't even wanna talk to you. Mm -hmm. Work, you've missed several days because you were too hungover and yeah. you just couldn't you do it. You had the flu. Yeah, you had the flu again. <laughs> right, right. Nobody gets it four times right. in one season, but you did. Right. right? Um, you now have financial issues. You, you're spending money you don't have and you're making bad financial choices. You have legal consequences. You have a DUI. You, you, know, you hurt somebody. You punch somebody in a bar fight because you were in a blackout and you didn't know what you were doing. Mm -hmm. So these are what we look for. Now, again, I was talking about middle alcoholism. You can be an alcoholic who's 19 and maybe you don't have any consequences yet to speak of. Although in the world we live in today with social media, the consequences seem to be showing up quicker for these folks, yeah. you know? Let me ask you this because, you know, m marijuana is becoming legal in many parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and, like you know, it's... <laughs> I hear people joke about it, about, you know, wanting to get a prescription for marijuana. Mm -hmm. And, you know... What does that look like? Because, you know, I can see myself having a glass of wine in front of my children. I could never imagine myself smoking marijuana in front of my children. I mean, it just, yeah. that is that normal? A, I don't think it is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't want to be judgmental. This one's a really hard one for me to talk about, Suzanne, because I feel like pot has ruined many people's lives that I know of, and especially mm -hmm. like in my family even, you know, well, I, you know, I can, my cousin is in recovery now and he's very vocal about it, but I mean, he was just a pothead, that's all, you know, and it ruins relationships, it ruins, you know, jobs, I mean, um, and then everybody says it's not a gateway, I'm sorry, I can't even have that debate with people because it is, mm -hmm. and my cousin would tell you, like, you know, it made it, normalized it for so many years that, and it was the thing that worked until it didn't, mm -hmm. And then there was pain meds and then, you know, and you will be hard pressed to find somebody who started on pain meds. Right. You know what I mean? They typically started, at least they did pot recreationally because it's a brain, it's a mindset of like, well, it's not that big a deal, you know, a little this, a little that. Like, yeah, I smoke a little. Oh, we'll have this pill. Okay, well, I'll try it. So we kind of, it loosens us up, you know, mm -hmm. especially for people that are rigid you know, um, if they get loose on that, then they get loose on, well, I'll try this or I'll try that pill or whatever. And now, now we're in a big crisis. Yeah. Certainly in the opioid crisis, people have a surgery and that can begin that mm -hmm. pathway. But I'm very nervous about the whole pot thing because so many people make it that it's not addictive. It's not an issue. Mm -hmm. Listen, anything, you, you can anything get can addicted addictive. to anything. Right. And that's another sign of addiction is, obsessions and compulsions mm -hmm. if you're waking up in the morning and the first thing that you're thinking about is smoking pot right. and it's obsession and then all through the day when can I get more how can I get more when can I go on break when can I get to that place to buy this or whatever anything we're doing that with that's what addiction looks like it looks like obsessions and compulsions oh it's my ritual I wake up and I smoke a bowl and then I go do this and then I come home for lunch and I smoke mm -hmm. a little bit and then on my way home I stop here and I get more if you're having obsessions and compulsions that speaks to addiction. Yeah. You know, it's interesting because, um, you know, I noticed after my divorce that I was drinking. Sure. I was self-medicating sure, a lot, you know, every single night having mm -hmm. a glass of wine or two or maybe it was three. Right. Um, 
And you know, what what really changed things for me, and I, I think, you know, obviously we wanna talk about what addiction looks like, um, but not just what addiction looks like, but if you're, if you're struggling with self-medicating with anything in your life, you know, what turned things around for me was really finding something healthy in my life. Mm -hmm. And it really did, and it wasn't an overnight thing. You know, you can't do yoga once and all of a sudden you're gonna not feel like having Woo! wine anymore. But I will tell you that doing yoga has and and creating sort of a healthier lifestyle it doesn't i don't feel the need for wine as much as i used to and granted right now during the holidays it feels like i need it a little bit more <laughs> but but um it when you start to replace those those compulsions and those needs with mm -hmm. something that's healthier it's almost like your body rejects the it, stuff that's not so healthy for It becomes, you. I love this word, counterintuitive. Yeah. It becomes like, well, wait a minute. Do I really want to eat this chocolate when I just worked out for mm -hmm. an hour? Because that doesn't really match up. Mm -hmm. So I think that what I agree with you. And the other thing that you're doing, Suzanne, is that we are self-soothing with chocolate, wine, whatever. So what's happening is you're telling me you learn to soothe in other ways. Nice. Yoga soothes me, meditation soothes me, reading my book soothes me, petting my dog soothes me. So you mm -hmm. found these other ways to soothe yourself so that now the wine is becoming a little further apart and you've got these other ways of soothing yourself. You know, yeah. that's really what it, and, and believe me, I mean. And it, you know, for people that are, and I know people that are struggling that, that have, you know, that legitimately need pain medication or sure. whatever it is Absolutely. that you legitimately need but yeah. I always feel like that's such the go-to for for you know the medical community and you know just give you a medicine and it'll make you feel better mm -hmm. but really you can start to heal yourself with you know creating healthy habits too I will tell you a very interesting story in my life so so genetically diabetes runs in my family in a way that is disastrous I mean deadly 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 and on my on my birth father side and um, I started to have some conflicts with prediabetes and so one day I woke up and I was like okay well diabetes is sugar right so I don't need sugar. I said to my family, I don't need sugar. We don't need sugar. Eric's like, no, you don't need sugar. I'm like, well, then I'm not going to have it. Yeah. So I went off sugar for about two years. Like I went off, I mean, zero, like no sugar. Like yeah, you were no very carbs. <laughs> I had not a dry, if it said one milligram, I'd be like, mm, okay. And I remember going back to my doctor and I lost like 20 pounds and went back to my endocrine doctor and she's like, oh, you know, look great. I mean, you, you seem to be doing good. Your numbers are much better. My God, they're down two points. What are you doing? I said, I went off sugar. And she went, what? what? <laughs> and I said, I went off, I, it's not required, right? I went off sugar. I just stopped sugar mm -hmm. and I stopped carbs. And she was like, well, you don't have to do that. <laughs> And I was like, Hello. but there's dead people all over the place in my family right. from diabetes, like ketoacidosis, drop dead, and this one lost their limbs and died, and like bad. Mm -hmm. And she's like, and she paused and she said, I have never, nobody's ever done that. And I actually got a little testy with her and I said, you know what, I have a question for you. Why didn't you recommend that I go off sugar? Right. I've been sick, I've been struggling, I've been, why didn't you recommend that I go off sugar? And she went, well, because nobody ever is willing to do that. And it was fascinating Crazy. for me that... But we're willing to pop a pill and not know what it does to our body. She has a ton of people on different diabetes medications. Yes. And don't get me wrong, this is a dicey disease. And, and if you need to have the medication, I right. understand it. And I might at some point, I mean, I, I, this is a tough disease. But the fact that she never even talked to of anybody about, about restricting their sugar or watching their sugar or going off sugar. And granted, the carbs is a dicey thing. Like now in my life, I have to have some carbs and it's all about finding the healthy. But she had never even discussed that with anybody or yeah. recommended like, hey, get with a good nutritionist and see if you can cut way back. Even when I would ask her when I started to be pre-diabetic, I say, wait a minute, I'm drinking chai tea every day. Is that okay? She goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you look up chai tea. It's like 30 milligrams of sugar. It's like your daily allowance for the whole day in one cup. If she had said to me, yeah, that's like sludge in your body. Like you're yeah. probably struggling since you're insulin resistant and your body's not 
wanting to break down sugar probably don't have that chai tea. Never said a word. Here, get these supplements, get these vitamins. So we are, I agree with you. Right. Now my new endocrinologist is all in and supportive and all that, but it's like even my old endocrinologist who's a wonderful human being is bought into this whole concept like, no, you don't need to do anything on your own. Right. Like just take a pill or take a drug or we can always right. put you on more insulin or more that. And so, yeah, I think that that's a profound way when you're looking at looking at addictions, you're looking at self-medicating, you know, exercising, meditation, yoga, a healthy the diet, gym, I mean, healthy diet, there's you know, water. Oh my gosh. Yeah. For me, I mean, I, I, you know, and this is all goes back to me because I, have addiction in my family. Mm -hmm. I, I have a brother who struggles with addiction. Um, you know, I had an uncle who struggled with addiction. And, um, you know, I, I know that I, you know, have a predisposition yeah. to, 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 to want to self soothe a little bit too much. Right. And so, you know, it just really was a wake up call for me, mm -hmm. especially after my divorce and, you know, feeling like I was a little bit out of control. Um, but what I started to do was just, you know, making myself lunch every day and I made myself a salad every day and, you know, really watching what I was eating. Mm. And then I re re found yoga and that really helped. And so, I mean, I'm not perfect, you know, I, <laughs> No, but you I had almost to have a, a three quarters of a bottle by, of wine by myself last night. <laughs> but, but I will tell you that it does get better. You know, it does get better when you start to really take care of yourself. Well, you know what you just reminded me of that's so important to talk about is that a lot of all of addiction mm -hmm. is about most of addiction. I have to be so careful, but most of addiction is about feelings. Yes. Okay. And so here's the thing. If you're looking at your life right now and you're saying, God, I've been drinking a lot of wine and you know, I just feel like crap every day when I wake up. That's another one. Like if you, f if you're doing something mm -hmm. that is providing negative consequences, one of them being that you feel horrible and you do it again, you might want to look at the addictive quality because who does that really? Like right. if I go to Zumba and then I feel like I'm going to die and I, and I injure every part of my body and then I go back again the next day like what? okay anything that's that causes you severe pain or whatever and you keep doing it might be an addiction thing but back to feelings so if you addictions are about feelings and they're about making feelings go feel away. better and go away and stuff so if you're re watching this video and you're saying to yourself okay I think that I have an issue with chocolate or wine or whatever it is pause before you have that glass of wine mm -hmm. pull out a pen and paper and write everything you're feeling. See if you can put some time and space. You're going through a divorce. I mean, nobody would believe this because my friends would laugh because I, I come from an alcoholic home. I'm not a drinker. I'm like a total lightweight. Yeah, you're one not. Drink. I'm just not a drinker, right? <laughs> so I give her one glass of wine. <laughs> yeah, no mas. So I'm not a drinker. I, I, you know, I got my stuff, but that's not it. Um, food, you know, sugar was a big thing for me. Shopping, love it but I'm not a drinker. So when I went through my divorce, I was like walking down the aisles. I'm in a house by myself with my two kids every night, lonely, lonely. So I'm walking down the aisle and I was like, mm, I love these fruity wine coolers. Like they're like <laughs> raspberry Kool-Aid and you know, blackberry special. They remind me of high school. They remind me of college and high school. Right. So I'd like grab a little four pack right. and you know, I'd think to myself, well, it's my reward. I'll go home, I'll get the kids in bed and then I'll have, and so for the first week it was like, oh, I had one, you know, every other night or whatever. And then the next week I was like, put the little four pack and then I was like, well, there's eight, seven days in a week. So I grabbed the next one and I go home and then I have a wine cooler every night after mm -hmm. the kids were in bed. And my third week at the grocery store, I was like grabbing for the second one. And literally I heard a voice go, what are you doing? Like, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. Your mom is an alcoholic. You're, you know, you, every family member you have is a drug and an alcoholic in recovery. What are you doing? And I'm like, oh, and I pulled it back out of the cart and I never, I, I don't think I've bought, and it's 13 years ago. Well, well, you really shouldn't, as an I adult, be buying wine buy coolers. It, bring it. <laughs> I'm just saying. No, the, no. The, this, there's a theme here. The last time I bought wine, I was headed to your house. <laughs> Bright blame. Yeah. Blame the wino. Yeah. The last time. But I mean, years went by that I didn't buy any wine because mm -hmm. I realized, and so it was like, I confronted myself. I'm like, you are in the darkest time of your life. Mm -hmm. Face it. Yeah. Deal with it. So 
recognizing that emotion is what we medicate over. So if you're not in therapy, even just holding yourself accountable, writing that journal, like a lot of people with food addiction have to keep a food journal because they're headed to the refrigerator for the fourth time. They've already eaten a meal. They don't need to be in the refrigerator. And their sponsor will say, put, put, sit down and write. Mm -hmm. And write about, you know, I feel so inadequate or so-and-so broke up with me over text and I just feel like a loser. And write about what's going on. You'd be surprised how just journaling and feeling, dealing with those emotions and getting that out of you feels so much better mm -hmm. You know what? I don't need that second bowl of ice cream, or I don't need, I don't need to do this. I'm not really hungry because that's the thing. It's like the craving, the hunger is feelings, right? And so if you deal with the feeling, you'd be like, you know what? I'm gonna go work out or do a little yoga. I really don't want a glass of wine. So see if you can deal with the feelings first, mm -hmm. and instead of medicating the feelings first. And then if you still want something, okay, right. but try to put a gap in there. Yeah, that's good advice. You know. Yeah, and also. Um, Oh, what was I going to say? I was just going to say something really profound. <laughs> but of course, Hold the I'm, phone. wait, how, we're in our 40s. So and it's been a long day. It has been a long day. And we have Christmas lights on in the background, yes. <laughs> which are distracting to me. Yes. Yes. Um, I can't. Um, oh gosh, I just had it again. Come okay, on, well, save on. me. Save me. Um, so, I did want to complete my thought and interrupt me when you get it back. Um, so, we have beginning, middle, and late stage. So, late stage alcoholism is, you guys know this one well, your family member's gone to the doctors, they have cirrhosis of the liver, they have a massive, you know, situation medically, and, and their doctor's like, you're, you're drinking, your, your organs are shutting done down. and you if you have another drink you're gonna die you know and so the medical things start to occur is mm -hmm. usually what we see in that late stage mm -hmm. um, certainly those other consequences can follow as far as you know family or DUIs and things like that but you know beginning middle late that's usually what we see is some kind of medical crisis what um, I know that this is kind of a little bit off topic but how if you're a parent and you are worried about your child, um, how do you kind of spot those signs in your child? I mean, you know, obviously teenagers, you can tell when, you know, if mm -hmm. they're not home at the right time or whatever, but you know, as they get a little bit older, how do you start to spot that? Well, again, I think that's why I love the consequences as a barometer is, is your child calling you from college? And you know, a lot of us nowadays, we have great relationships with our kids. I mean, there's so much with social media, you, you kind of, there's not much to, to the imagination anymore. You kind of know what your kids are doing. And right. so a lot of kids are really forthright with their, their parents now. So when your kid is calling you and she's crying, she's embarrassed, she, she doesn't know where she was when she woke up this morning, or she's having these consequences, that's when I would say it's important to you know, sit down and say, you know, I'm, I'm worried because normal drinking doesn't look like this, mm -hmm. you know, and trying to explain, you know, what social drinking, yeah, social drinking, you have a few drinks, you start to feel a little buzz, hmm, I'm out, I'm 19 years old, I don't really want to be in an environment where I'm not safe, mm -hmm. let me start drinking some waters and let me kind of pull back a little bit or, you know, that there's some accountability, I'm really just doing this to connect and be social, I really don't want to be obliterated, I don't want to be vomiting, I don't, you know, so that ability to control. So when you're seeing that your kid is telling you that they got in trouble, they're having consequences, they got arrested, they, they, you know, they got raped and that, that's a bad example, but they found themselves in a situation where that they're like, I, yeah, I was, it was dangerous yeah. that you know, it's never anybody's fault, but I was completely blacked out and I was passed out in the fraternity house. And then these bad things happen and they're feeling horrible guilt and shame that they even were in that situation. That kind of thing where they're beating themselves up, they're feeling guilty, they're feeling ashamed. I think as parents, sometimes we can kind of say, well, you know, like they're just being kids, yeah. right? They're in college. Right, and you don't want to beat up on them. I, I, and I hate the rape example because it's nobody's fault that's right. getting raped. But, um, you know, when they're beating up on themselves, they're embarrassed, they're ashamed of their behavior that they're doing, or they're in a blackout and they don't know what they're doing. That I think it's healthy as a parent to say, honey, that doesn't look like normal social drinking to me. Yeah. That looks like you might have a brain chemistry where when you add alcohol, your brain is off to the races and mm -hmm. you unbeknownst to you, not wanting to get into a bad situation, but you're finding yourself in bad situations. You're finding yourself not able to decide for yourself. You're finding you have no memory or recollection and that's called a blackout. And that's not part of normal drinking. Yeah, and I think it's so important as parents that we are honest with our kids about that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. I mean, don't be scared to talk to your kids about that, especially if you have alcoholism in your family. You know, right. do, 
And, and that you should be talking to them when they're young. I mean, yeah. I've already had the conversation with both of my kids, and they're yeah. 12 and 8, about having alcoholism in our family. Yeah, and it's know? part of the genetics. Just like, you know, I, I've talked to my kids about diabetes, you know? Right. It's like, which they ignore. But they're <laughs> <laughs> like, really, as they're mom. eating candy. <laughs> Um, that one's gone over like a lead balloon. But yeah, I definitely think it's important to share that with your kids. And, you know, I have the blessing of having sober people in my family. So they role model like, hey, this yeah. is how I used to be. This is how I got in trouble. This is where I'm at now. So definitely don't hide it. If, if you're sober, that's amazing. Please incorporate your child into mm -hmm. that and let them know that they're predisposed because yeah. they are. And, um, and, and talk about your college experiences and good and bad or whatever, or your experiences that they're doing that are similar, that they're clubbing and you used to go to the club and so that you can educate on some normalcy because they're, if here's the funny thing, if you're an alcoholic, who do alcoholics hang out with? Other alcoholics. Other alcoholics. So their ability to judge normal is going to be zero because they're going to be drawn to the people that do it just like them. Mm -hmm. And then you say, well, this is an issue. And they go, you don't know anything. Everybody. So sharing about you know what it looks like to be normal and what is acceptable, what is social, what is problematic. And explaining the brain chemistry because a lot of people don't understand that. That when I put this in my brain, these things happen, happen. and it's not my you know, fault. I explain it to my kids like an allergy. I mean, it's like it an, is allergy. an allergy. You know, you you have an allergy if, if yep. to to something. You don't eat it, you know, because your body rejects it. Mm -hmm. So it's the same with alcohol. If you have an allergy to that, you can't have it. But here's know? what's fascinating. Do you know what's fascinating about allergies? We crave them. If you are allergic to something, you will crave it. Really? Absolutely. Oh, that's interesting. Yep. Not so, allergic to anything. So. Yeah. <laughs> so people that are alcoholics crave alcohol. Interesting. And their body has an abnormal reaction to it. it. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Same thing yeah. with sugar. It's fascinating. It is fascinating. So, yeah. All right. Well, that was a good discussion. Thank you, Shannon. And if you have any specific questions about addiction, she is a, an, ad, are you, would you call yourself an addiction specialist? Um, I've or, certainly worked, worked in, in the field, field for, yeah. I did 13 years at a treatment center in their family program. So specializing with family members of addicts. Mm -hmm. I am not recovering addict. I am recovering love addict. I'm recovering <laughs> I'm a recovering love addict too and a codependent. Yeah. So, you know, I like to date the alcoholic <laughs> and try to save them. But, you know, but I definitely have had, you know, my mom has 35 years of sobriety. So I've learned so much from just being around individuals that have sobriety. And then also I grew up with her because I'm not 35. I'm going to be 46. So I did 10 years with a drunk mom and 35 years, you know, with a sober, with mom. A sober mom. So, you know, lots of exposure to addiction. Yeah. So if you have any questions, you can leave a comment. If you guys have any mm -hmm. To, uh, show topics that we'd like us to yes, discuss. Please. We are open to it. Um, we appreciate you watching our videos, what your friends won't tell you. We appreciate you sharing our videos. We appreciate you liking our videos. Um, so thank you all for watching and happy, happy holidays. holidays. <laughs> all right, bye We're guys. Out. <laughs>